evening one, and I'd like to invite Brian Gray to join us at the table. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming in. So uh, you heard my, well, before committee members got here, the, our task today, filling ourselves in on the ability to grow these programs uh, in a way that I just, I'd say we'd like to get a lot more work done. We don't know how fast and how far we can go uh, sort of responsibly. Sure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my testimony is, is uh, right down that alley. So um, I'll go right into it. My name is Brian Greggs. I'm the general manager of the Energy Co-op of Vermont. Before joining the Energy Co-op, I was employed by Vermont Gas for nearly 30 years. At Vermont Gas, I served in a variety of positions. The most recent is the Energy Services Manager, where I was responsible for sales and marketing, as well as the Energy Efficiency Utility. The Energy Co-op of Vermont is a member-owned, not-for-profit provider that delivers fuel oil, kerosene, and wood pellets. We maintain and install heating equipment, including cold climate heat pumps and uh, heat pump water heaters. We provide energy efficiency services, including energy audits, energy coaching, and home weatherization. We have approximately 2,000 members in Northwestern Vermont. Co-op's mission is to help our members reduce their energy use and help transition them to fossil fuels to more efficient and renewable sources uh, of coal heating options. One of the core services central to our mission is to provide energy audits and weather weatherized homes for our members. Energy audits and energy coaching are instrumental to the homeowner in providing them a roadmap on how to achieve energy efficiency and develop a plan for transition to renewables. Currently, the Energy Co-op has one energy auditor and a weatherization crew, which consists of a crew chief and two technicians. On average, we complete 100 energy audits per year and 60 home weatherization projects. The biggest hurdle in expanding our weatherization services at the Co-op is the availability of technicians. Air sealing and insulating homes is a tough and dirty job. It requires a certain amount of physical abilities as well as an aptitude for carpentry and mechanical skills. To get to our current level of expertise and staffing, it took approximately two years. Over that period, we were unable to find candidates that had experience in the field, so we hired and provided on-the-job training from the ground up. This was an arduous process. We hired multiple technicians who had never worked in the weatherization field. Once they were on the job for a few weeks, they really decided, this is not for me. Again, it's a really tough and, and dirty job. Fortunately, through this trial and error process, we eventually found individuals that stuck it out, and after approximately six months of on-the-job training, have become very good technicians. Inability to hire weatherization positions is not unique to the field. At the Energy Co-op, we struggle to find qualified HVAC technicians and delivery drivers. The availability of trades-related workforce is essential to our ability to sustain and grow our business. I feel the barrier, the biggest barrier to expanding weatherization services is not the ability to find trained employees, it's the ability to find any employees who are interested and willing to do this type of work. Publicly available training for weatherization techs is available within the state. Building Performance Institute certification courses are offered by state colleges a few times per year. These courses are very good and go into a great deal of depth. I feel these offerings are more geared to an energy auditor than they are a weatherization technician. Efficiency Vermont offers periodic air sealing and insulation courses. At the high school level, students who go through building trades or carpentry specific technical training programs receive classroom training on insulating and air sealing, which provides a good base for further education. Training for weatherization techs is like other fields such as carpentry, plumbing, and electrical, where knowledge is gained through the classroom offerings, but the real training is done as, as an apprentice working on the job. The learning curve for weatherization tech is shorter than in some other fields. Practically speaking, Someone with a building trace background can be a fully functional as a weatherization tech for four weeks. Others with less building trace experience may take four to six months to become fully functional. According to estimates provided by the Office of Economic Opportunity, 
The modernization program currently completes 80 to, uh, 800 to 900 low-income eligible homes per year. In order to double that number of low-income completions, all we all would need to increase the number of crews available for this work significantly. By extrapolating the energy cost production rate of weatherization project completions of approximately 1.15 homes per week per crew, I would estimate an increase of 13 to 15 additional weatherization crews, which is equivalent to 40 <coughs> employees, would be needed to double the number of completions from 850 homes per year to 1,700 homes per year. As noted earlier, there are essentially no trained weatherization technicians available at this time and a limited number of people interested in doing this type of work. Acquiring 40 to 60 new employees would require significant time and training. The OEO weatherization program is currently delivered through the five community-based providers who hire and train staff to deliver these services. An alternative to increasing staff with OEO would be to develop more public-private partnerships. Existing private contractors like the Energy Co-op could provide weatherization services to OEO's clients immediately for its existing staff. Delivery of services can be ramped up much quicker because of direct access to a trained workforce. The cost and risk involved in growing and training that new workforce could be transferred to the private contractors. In the short term, there are 44 private contractors, 44 private contractors listed by Efficiency Vermont under the heading for insulation and air sealing services. These contractors are located throughout all corners of the world. In the longer term, opportunities for private companies to expand into energy-related services, such as weatherization, dovetails very well with the decrease in the need for labor in the fossil fuel infrastructure and distribution business. Local fuel dealers are looking for alternative business opportunities in the energy sector, and a public-private partnership to be a win-win scenario for all parties. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of staffing, uh, you saying acquiring 40 to 60 new employees would require significant time and training and, and also that it would be hard to find those people. So what are the obstacles to uh, increasing that workforce? I mean, is it the starting pay or you know, the nature of the work? People don't like crawling around in what damn crawl spaces or hot attics or all of the above, and I think it, it goes one, one level further, is the opportunity to find trades-related people in the state is getting harder and harder. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, regardless if it's a service technician or a organization <coughs> technician, uh, folks are not looking to get into that business any longer. They're more looking to go to a four-year college and get a degree and become a doctor or whatever, which is fine. Uh, What's the <clears throat> average cost of an employee? Obviously, you're going to have benefits salary, et cetera, like what, what's the, what do they typically make? Uh, what we pay at the co-op starting is $18 an hour plus benefits. Uh, so, and the total cost for that employee is about $60,000 a year. So, that's, so you're talking $3 million of the $4 million they're looking to raise or so just going to the employees? Which employee were you describing? The crew chief or the two tip technician? Technician, the technician. Four weeks? If they have building traits uh, background and the hourly pay or uh, yeah, what's it? What's here? Eighteen. Our starting is eighteen. For a crew chief, that's a year. Yeah. For a crew chief, we're talking uh, twenty-four, twenty-five dollars an hour. And then an energy auditor, right? So there's a couple of components here. You need you need someone to go in and actually take evaluate the home for you to support you now for the organization services. Mm -hmm. So an energy auditor is at another level. And what's the um, flow of people? And what are the? Can you talk a little bit about training? I mean, if you're hired onto a by a private employer, they do their own training. But do uh, is that the usual? Route, or do you get people out of high school programs, out of tech centers, out of ETC? All of the above. Um, there's there's not a lot coming through the from the college um, level. Uh, there's nothing specific in regards to a web location type um, education. Mostly it's through the, the building trades. We'll start off in the car carpentry level. And part of that is including uh, insulation and air sealing. So it's not, not a direct uh, education, if you will. Where we're finding folks is essentially 
folks with no, no, no background in weatherization whatsoever and we're taking the complete route of training them. So are the tech centers doing any of this training? The tech centers are doing some, but it's more down that, again, that carpentry line where right. this so. uh, weatherization is just a, a, a segment of that. Sure. Because one of the problems I see in what you're paying people is that anybody with good carpentry skills is already making more than that. Absolutely. And so that's the challenge. How do you, and I think the answer is to work more closely with the tech centers and try to get kids early on that don't have the ability to make $35 an hour because they're a skilled carpenter and steer them that direction. And but that's a good starting pay for a kid and they get a lot of experience, which maybe then they can move up to be crew chiefs and train other people and all that. But it seems to me it's gonna be hard to scale this up unless we are actively going after uh, young people who aren't gonna or don't want to go to college and want to do something in the trades. One of the issues in, in today's economy is, at least in the private sector, is the payback on doing a weatherization uh, project can be mm -hmm. 10 to 20 mm -hmm. years, so it's way out there. And it, uh, the more uh, increase in uh, pay towards the uh, installers just pushes that out and makes it harder to get people to move forward with weatherization projects. Um. I remember going to a RIF conference, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. The conversation that I had over lunch was all about <coughs> tech centers. I think they were talking about Hannaford Tech Center, and I think that's Essex Junction, I think. Um, and that they were, weatherization was part of that program, just exact, sort of like a feeder program into this work. I don't know if that is not, you know, as you say, it's just part of learning carpentry, and they're really interested in becoming a carpenter who knows something about weatherization as opposed to less training and thinking that would direct you over to just doing weatherization. No, I, I think Senator Rogers is absolutely right. Uh, if you come out of the tech center, you're going to want to go the carpentry route because you could end up making that 40, 30, 40, 50 dollars an hour as opposed to the lower end of the weatherization side. It is, it is not easy work getting up into attics. And no, and you do need those carpentry skills. And you, you do, do a good job at it. Yeah. You need to be a decent carpenter, or at least a, you know a mediocre carpenter with your foreman or whatever you want to call them. There has to be some person on the job that's a good carpenter. Uh, another piece that you haven't brushed on, but I'm sure you run into, we heard a concern about being able to weatherize some of the older homes, like wet basements and stuff, situations like that, because of mold issues. How do you guys typically deal with a situation like that? I've wet basements are not an issue. You know, there's always a way to solve that. The bigger, bigger issue is have uh, uh, the uh, you know what the term is, the asbestos related mm -hmm. materials yeah. but in the ceilings. That is a big job that's way out of our scope and you need to bring in private contractors to do that and it's very, very expensive. And as soon as you find it, most of the homeowners are gonna go, we can't afford that. Absolutely. Because it's ridiculously expensive to get rid of that stuff that may have asbestos in it. Uh, yeah, so what happens in those cases? Do you, you visit a site and you see uh, insulation that might have asbestos and you just notify that you, you can't go further? We, we don't have the training or the skills to go further. So what we do is provide them information on the companies that do and get them in touch with them. And most of them do drop out because it's a very expensive process. But is it also either unwise or you're not allowed to go ahead and do weatherization work? because you're seeing uh, a potential hazard? Like, you, you guys can't be in the space, or it doesn't, I mean, for instance, if it's insulation on pipes, but you're gonna be sealing the sill and weatherizing, uh, um, insulating the band joist all the way around, something like that, whatever. We could do that as long as we don't. Do that. Yeah, we could absolutely do that as long as we don't uh, make the material airborne in any, any way. Mm -hmm. So the, the bigger issue, you know, in the basements and stuff like that, not an issue. It's it's, it's in the in the attic. You know, if it's blown in that type of or in the walls, or in the walls, blown yeah. in the walls. 
then that's where you need to uh, cover the whole house. So you'll see a tent over the whole house so that doesn't go anywhere. And that's the very special uh, uh, technology. Mm -hmm. and, and expensive. And those guys expensive. specialize and they make tons of money. Is that um, asbestos or vermiculite or vermiculite has asbestos? That's the term. Vermiculite is, is the name of the insulation that contains asbestos. It may, it may or may, may not. It depends on where it was made. As soon as they find it. There's no test. But we don't know that. With the naked eye, all we know is vermiculite. And it very well could be or may not. Yeah. So there's no way to track the manufacturer where it was. You just have to treat it like yeah. it is the problem. Yeah. And, and what percentage of homes, I mean, I. I can tell you, I probably have it up in our ceiling. Like in yeah. my house built in the 1950s, but you talk, these older homes had it sprayed up. So that's what I mean, so this is, is that as much a barrier to weatherization as, as anything? Like is that the, that we have to come up with? Well, it's a barrier to those individuals because it's so much more expensive. I, you know, I, I hate to, from our, from our perspective, you know, we probably see maybe five to 10% of the homes having that as we do. Think for a long time. Ten percent. <laughs> I think for, <laughs> us, I think this has been weatherized except the attic. I think for a long time the state went around blowing that into people's walls to help them insulate homes that weren't insulated. Right? I they were the time, was, they were. There yeah. were weatherization yeah. programs where I know they were drilling holes and blowing something in the walls. And, and I'm going to guess that's a lot of what it was. And that was going on uh, without the wow. state subsidizing it. Just a practice. Oh, um, no. 40, it, it, 40 years ago. There was a lot of that. It was low income connected, and you could apply, and I can't remember which groups were running it, but they would come and drill holes in the wall and blow the stuff mm -hmm. in and then put the plugs back in. It just makes me wonder if we should consider you know, some of this money for asbestos remediation if we're not going to get a certain <clears throat> level of projects done. I don't even know what that costs. That kind of well, that, but that's, I mean, if you're in, we're, yeah. if we have a goal to meet so many homes. You say if it's deterring people. Yeah, because if, uh, if you're trying to help a certain income level of people and they can't afford to remove the asbestos, that home's right. never going to get weatherized. That's the old program. We're looking at homes now, people. So homes, 10% of homes, so you're never going to get your full problem solved. You're still going to have 10 to percent of homes that are going to have this issue. Unless they agree the whole house except for the asbestos part, like what I think Senator McDonald was going to or would we define that as a weatherized home? Good question. Depends on whether you're upstairs or downstairs. I, you're totally ignoring that one part. <coughs> the, yeah. uh, you're counting about 40 to 60 people. So um, is there, are there 40 to 60 people already? Is there capacity in the <coughs> private market already? Uh, crews that aren't doing as much work as they could so that they could be a buffer like while you were hiring some work could be contracted out if but my gut tells me that there's not the available staff at the moment um, but I feel that we would be able to gear up quickly and bring in new employees to train uh, and get, get, uh, get going and, you know if, if I saw the energy co-op moving into providing some of these services we will start funding these jobs into our existing jobs while bringing in new employees to, to uh, receive on the job training and get them ready to develop a secondary crew or we can start doubling our production. Um, one quick question is, is, have you seen in your time in the business um, the uh, OEOs contract out to privates to do any of the work? Yes, um, not specifically Liberalization. We worked with OEO in regards to um, furnace replacements, um, types of things that are a little less specific to their their uh, tasks. But absolutely, there's already that partnership built. Okay. All right. Great. Um, any other questions for Mr. Gray? Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Good to hear from people. Good experience. <clears throat> Um, I can ask, uh, invite Ms. Fielder to join us at the table. Good morning. Good morning. Nice Good morning. to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for coming Thank in. So amongst the tasks we're looking at is, uh, you know, we're, we need the capacity to do more work and we're trying to figure out some of the obstacles to getting more work done, uh, especially on the 80 to 100 
100% where you're leaving income folks. Okay. One of the questions is, <coughs> these things are always cost effective in the end. What are the obstacles to moving ahead? And we're wondering what do we uh, access to money or cheap enough money is the, the barrier. And if you have any other thoughts around that. Sure. Um, and maybe you could tell us about your yeah. program. Yeah, sure. So my name is Lori Fielder, and I'm the Green Program Director of BSCCU. Um, we're a statewide credit union. Anyone who lives or works in Vermont can join. Um, and we have several programs um, around uh, financing um, that's available for weatherization, um, efficiency upgrades, heat pumps, solar. Um, we do a, we've done a number of private-public partnerships. Um, actually, Energy Call for Vermont is somebody, you know, is a company we work with frequently. Um, and you know, we're also a member of VFDA, actually. Um, and we also run the heat, uh, the V-Heat program. So um, besides financing, we, do, we also um, help um, provide some alternatives for Vermonters that are, that are purchasing heating fuel and propane and so forth, and chips, um, you know, and pellets. So the programs that we've been um, that we've been working on uh, over the past uh, four or five years, um, V Green's been around since 2012. So we've been in the space a long time. Um, we originally worked with uh, Efficiency Vermont back um, even before that in the early 2000s to provide an interest rate buy down program, um, and then we've uh, we also worked with solar communities, which. Um, was a program born out of uh, VPIRG, which then became SunCommon. And um, so through these partnerships, we expanded the program. <coughs> we offer, uh, VGreen is a kind of a full suite of um, financing options ranging you know, from unsecured to secured loans, um, green, you know, for green vehicles, um, and we have some home equity loan options too. So really what we did is we um, just have learned from the market. You know, we responded to what um, our partners, um, you know, our, our, our sort of partners in terms of vendors and contractors that are out there um, really feel like would be most helpful for their customers, um, but also what our members want. Um, and so now we have, uh, you know, uh, loans that go up to $60,000 unsecured. Um, which has been a pretty popular option. We also are um, one of the original um, lenders for the Heat Saver Loan. This has been a particularly important program because this partnership, uh, first with the Department of Public Service um, and now with Efficiency Vermont, allows us to offer discounted interest rates for weatherization, um, heat pumps, so they all have to be qualifying measures. Um, so they have to be um, something that is going to, um, you know, save people money on their on their heating and um, you know on their building operation. Um, and that program has been very successful. Um, we've gone through a number of grant, um, you know, installments, um, about three hundred and eighty to four hundred thousand with uh, the Department of Public Service through 2018, March of 2018. And starting in March of 2018, it switched over to Efficiency Vermont, and that program, um, you know, they administer the program, they, they fund the buy-down. Um, so while the program capital is BSCCUs, and there are also two other lenders um, in, in the program, um, they do, they fund the buy-down portion. So, Basically, that's the difference between what somebody might have paid for their, their interest rate up front and what they end up getting um, for an interest rate. And what's important is that it's, it's tiered by household income. So, you know, I like to think of it as sort of picking up where the low income weatherization program maybe, you know, it's, it kind of meets it. Um, so, uh, for households that are earning below, or their, their household income is below 60000 they can get as low as zero percent on their on their interest rate if they qualify for the loan. Um, and um, you know, honestly, that is our mission. We are a mission-driven, member-owned organization. Um, you know, financial um, cooperative. <coughs> and 
and um, so that is part of our mission to be able to, um, you know, make this these funds accessible to as many people that qualify as possible. Great. Oh, Senator Campion. So. <clears throat> I may have missed this, but do you have a lot of people taking advantage of these things? Do you have any numbers that you could share yeah, with us? Yeah, yeah, so sorry I didn't prepare. So oh, no, that's okay. I literally no, uh, no. found out about this pretty quickly. So um, from 2014 to March 2018, we originated 5.3 million in the Heat Saver program. Um, so that, um, that translated to about 500 loans. Um, so the average loan size of that is a, um, approximately uh, 10, thousand um, dollars and that one specifically was the heat the heat saver, heat saver. Program. okay so people would have used those dollars for yeah. they would have used them through the um, efficiency excellence network which is the qualified um, you know contractors I believe that's what Brian's alluding to the 44 okay. um, qualified contractors so it's they're really I mean they're, they're private contractors so it's really a market driven you know program where we don't do a lot of advertising about it because that's really what they do. Um, and so we're there to, to fund, to finance the loans, um, but that's their part. And we've always kind of looked at it that way, like everybody should do what they do best sure. in, in, the, in the partnership. So, you know, the contractors do what they do best and we do what they, we do best and Efficiency Vermont does what they do best, which is kind of form the, you know, they form the, the triangle seems to work well. Um, and we also have, in the in the whole Be Green program, I mean, so, you know, 5.3 million in that period of time, but the whole Be Green program, we have about a $60 million portfolio. So we do a lot of yeah. um, financing outside of, um, of, a, of that program, but, you know, we've, we've had a lot of experience and, you know, adopted the program. To so those folks needs. that are under household incomes of 60,000, mm -hmm. are you hearing from them also? Absolutely. Okay, great. That's so 75% right. of the loans in that um, 2014 to 18 yeah. um, period, 75% were in the two lower income tiers. Okay. So, you know, remember that, you know, low income doesn't necessarily mean low credit. Um, uh -huh, many right. of these folks um, qualify for, for financing and, yeah. um, you, know, or, you know, sometimes better than, than people that are of higher means. Sure. Can you uh, just spell out the, the tiers that you were talking about? Sure, so the income tier, so it's um, below 60, and then 60 to 90, and then above 90. Okay. And that's household income. So it means, um, you know, pretty much what, what HUD would consider household income. Okay. And so you were just saying, so for the, the first two tiers, 60 and 60 to 90, that covers 75% of your loans. Yeah, they've, they've adjusted a little bit since Efficiency Vermont took over administration of the program, but they're pretty close to those. So we really find, you know, and, and um, in starting in 2019, I've been kind of following what we're seeing, and, you know, we certainly could use more uptake in the program, because um, that's the idea, is to get the, the money out there, but I think Efficiency Vermont, I mean, they can speak to this better than I can, you, know, you have to be careful about how much you advertise it because there's only so much money in that buy down program. Right. So it's a balancing act of how much do they advertise it. I mean, we'll, we'll finance what we get, but yeah. Do you exhaust the uh, buy down dollars you get each um, period? We, we come pretty close. We, we did in the, in the state program, but that was, uh, so one of the things that was important about how the program changed is in that 2014 to 2018 period, you know, March, that was as low as zero percent, and then last year, it, that that lowest tier went up to 0.99, and we did see a slowing down in that in the uptake. Um, obviously, zero percent is a pretty powerful market mm -hmm. signal, <laughs> so people take advantage of that. Yeah. And, but that's good because those are the people in the low, only the people in the lowest income tier are going to receive that rate, and for, it's for a loan up to five years. Um, and so, what's the total number of buy down dollars you get um, annual? Um, so, we have a contract, and you know, it's it kind of depends <coughs> on the year. Um, and we try to, you know, we work with Efficiency Vermont on that um, 
and this past <coughs> this coming year we're in the range of about um, you know 280 to 300,000. Okay. And so you're not advertising that much yourself, right? Right. We certainly have it available on our website, but we don't do um, outside of being at events and letting people know about it. We don't do a lot of um, really. Um, outreach that is targeted um, I suppose we could but we work with efficiency Vermont on that and just try to manage um, so if we were able to raise more money and send basically something like 50% more dollars on the low income and as well as we we're talking about trying to increase the middle income yeah. folks you're talking about um, do you have a sense of the capacity of your system to take on more money and sort of spend it well? I guess that's always the question for us. Yeah, if, they can, if, the, if there's more money in the program, um, in, the, in the overall fund for, for Efficiency Vermont, and they choose, you know, they, we go through a selection process and they choose via CCU, um, you know, we'll, we'll, do, we'll be able to meet that capacity, whatever that would be. Um, so can you say something? I didn't know there was a selection process. How does that work? Yeah, so they, they I mean, through their, you know, we, there was an RFP that was put out. So, um, you know, they could have, uh, you know, financial institutions could um, put in a proposal to, to um, run the program or be a lender in the program. So there's, there's the SCCU and two other lenders this year. Um, so it is sort of an annual process. Um, and since you uh, spent a lot of time talking to people who are qualifying for a loan, I'm guessing you have a sense of what helps them decide to go ahead and do it or not. And, um, so can you say something about what it, one of the things I think leaves a lot of people scratching their head is when we have something like a, a zero interest loan or a very low interest loan, and their cost of, the measures are cost effective over time, why don't more people act? Do you have a sense of what holds people back yeah, I mean, from you know, just just for full disclosure, I did work for the for um, well, it was community action um, for four years. So, um, in you know, now it's capstone. Um, and you know, from my from what you know, this is just what I see. I think it's a complicated uh, it's a complicated project. It's not like putting a deck on. You know, everybody knows what putting a deck on looks oh, like no. and feels like. Um, this, uh, when you say I'm going to do an energy renovation or I'm going to weatherize my home, um, people don't really know what that entails. Um, and like Brian alluded to, there's also um, sometimes more than one contractor involved. We, um, many of the heat saver loans that we process um, have several, you know, you know, several invoices involved. You know, there might be one from the auditor and then from the phone contractor, from the Vermiculite remediation company, um, and we do finance um, Vermiculite remediation. So I think that it's more about public education, and you know, keeping, um, you know, having, having there be that third party, you know, kind of trust um, that that the consumer has. That's why they like the heat saver program because there is um, a process to it. Uh, I think they feel like they're getting what. They, you know, they're working with a contractor that's certified. It's really important that they be certified and know what they're doing um, because it can really mess up your house if they don't know what they're doing. Um, so I think it's just a matter of public education. You know, for years we used to hear, well, there's no money to finance or fund these projects, and and our for us that's not the issue. I mean, we'll we'll finance them if we get those applications and they're qualified. It's more about getting people to make that step. And, and many times, once they've done one thing, um, they're ready to do the next. And the heat saver loan is great because you can borrow up to 35,000 total. So we could, we've done many loans for people where they've done a piece of it. And then a year or two later, they come back and say, I wanna do another piece. Fine, you know, we'll do two heat, we'll do as many loans as it, they would like, but we total for that house, for that family, we'll, you know, it's up to 35,000. Um, who's the point of contact for the heat savers on? Is it uh, Efficiency Vermont? Yeah, so they are the, they're the program administrator. 
So um, it would, you know, Abby White would be somebody that would know um, more. You know, I work, I work with kind of a team of people. <coughs> From your point of view, or and talking about the people that you're financing, does Efficiency Vermont turn out to be for them sort of a turnkey solution? I mean, did they show up and say, oh, well, we know how to, we'll guide you through the audit and finding the right contractors? I mean, yes. Is that it, a it, role they play? Absolutely. And we want that because we're, we're, our expertise is financing. You know, we're not building contractors and we're not efficiency utilities. We're, we're the finance piece of the puzzle. And, They've been excellent. Their customer service staff is excellent. We rely on them all the time. Um, and we get sometimes we get a pretty complicated application with some some measures we're not sure about because it just hasn't been something we've seen. Um, so we refer the the information to them and they help us sort it out and say, <coughs> yep, this is you know it's a twenty thousand dollar project, but really only fifteen thousand is going to qualify for the heat saver loan. So then in that case, what we can do is still help them with a regular V Green loan, you know, because we have that program separately. Um, so they can do 15,000, we'll do a heat saver loan, and the remaining five we can still do. Because many people have projects that, you know, maybe they needed to, they're, they're really tearing something apart. So they, they, you know, they can't leave the walls open, they still need to enclose it. But the overall project is giving them the benefit that they need. Is, uh, did you take a loan to include things like replacement of boilers? Um, funny you should mention that. Um, so <coughs> the, um, it has um, only only qualifying high efficiency equipment, um, but that uh, boilers and um, and furnaces um, that piece is expiring on March thirty first. Okay. So that um, I don't really know. So okay. that's a for efficiency Vermont, but. Um, we know that we are accepting applications to replace um, for those replacements through um, March 31st. So it does include heat pumps um, and heat pump water heaters, um, and it does include advanced wood pellet um, technology and wood stoves. That's new this year, high efficiency wood stoves, which is great because we work. You know, many of our members are you know are wealthy people and. They're, they're heating with wood stoves just like just like I do, you know? so they need to have um, access to that kind of financing. And so we we have financed, um, you know, since January several heat, you know, wood stoves. Okay, um, and then just a, people uh, often talk about switching, you know, electrification of many things, cars, and yes. heating. Can you ballpark the when someone's doing a loan? How often are they including heat pumps? Or if they're replacing uh, a boiler or something like that, are they getting a new, tend to get a new boiler or tend to swap over to a heat pump? If they're getting a new boiler or furnace, that's what they're getting. Um, we've, I can't say we've never done any. We probably have done a combination. But if, if they're switching their, their um, you know, existing heating system, that's what the, they're pretty much sticking with that. Um, if people are switching entirely, the heat pump is usually part of a bigger package, like the weatherization. So that's been something we've been happy to see as many times, because we do track if it's um, how many measures they're doing. So many times um, weatherization and heat pumps are part of the whole package, and you know, Efficiency Vermont does a good job really promoting that approach instead of just you know throwing it in and not doing that analysis. Great. Um, if you, so I've asked a bunch of questions, but is there something you think we should be keeping in mind that I haven't asked about or the committee hasn't asked about? Um, yeah, two things. One is, um, you know, that don't forget about these folks that are, you know, don't qualify for, you know, the low income weatherization program. Um, so I think it's great to, if, if there's a way to, to keep this program going. It's been successful both as a pilot and as a, as a regular program. Um, but also, it's important to keep it simple. Um, the more complicated a program is, the less uptake there is. This is already complicated enough. You know, it's, it's sort of like financing a root canal. You know, I mean, you're glad the financing is there for this project, but it's not something that you know, it's not some wonderful thing that you then can show off to your neighbor. So, keeping it simple is really important. Right. Yeah, and, and, you know, you've done weatherization work. All of us have done weatherization work. Most of you're not seeing 
<clears throat> houses can be way more comfortable to live in, but it's an yes. important benefit, but sort of subtle. And most people come back to us. We do get, we have testimonials. People come back to us um, later and say, I'm so glad that this was available and that we had this um, option available. And, and you know, they don't talk about the loan payment. They talk about how much more comfortable they are and how much um, they, they, they are saving money, but it's not always the top reason people are doing the work. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I invite uh, Ms. Hubert to join us. Um, and this is my colleague, Kathy Garland. Okay. We're both yeah, from great. Vermont Technical College. Um, if you'd like to pull two chairs to the end of the table, if we can get you a, another chair, maybe. I can, I can stand that. No, no. Let me go to the chairs. No, I'll get Thank you, Senator Kim. The frugal state house, you know, we, we actually swap chairs around between committee meetings sometimes. So. Well, um, so I'm Maureen Peter. I'm the Associate Dean of Continuing Education and Workforce Development at okay. Vermont Tech. I'm Kathy Barwin. I am the uh, Project Manager for Green Training at Vermont Tech. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming in. Um, so we've been, you know, we're on this mission to help more people get more homes weatherized, and we're talking about across the board. Uh, and one of the things oh, thank you as we're much. looking at increasing uh, the work in the state on that is we have enough trained employees, and the answer is coming back not really. And so we're interested in learning more about how we can, uh, if we're going to put more money out into those programs, help ensure that we'll, they'll be trained techs out in the field, um, ready to take those jobs. Wonderful. So about um, probably several years ago, Vermont Tech embarked on a renewable energy program. And from that, we created a center for sustainability on our campus. And um, the handout that I just provided has a listing of some of the workforce development programs that we have created over the years. It initiated through a, a grant that we received through the Department of Labor. And one of those programs is BPI, Building Performance Institute. And um, over the years, we've, we've had many people throughout the state go through that program. It is an intensive program, but it is the standard. How long does it last? Intensive. It's a week long training. Week long and training. Then every day, every nine day. to five, yeah. five, seven days. Five days. Five days. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you leave the program, you're certified. Uh, no, what yeah. you have to do is you have a week long training. Okay. And then the following week, the way that we run it, the following week on Monday, they have to take an online exam. You have to pass the online exam, and then you have to do a field exam. Okay. That is very rigorous, yeah. and then you have to pass the field exam in order to get the certification. <coughs> we and this would certify you to do what exactly? Be a building analyst or a building envelope professional. We did a dual certification, okay. a building analyst and envelope professional, and uh, this past uh, um, year we've been working with Efficiency Vermont, mm -hmm. Um, and they've said, they've told us that really instead of a dual certification, uh, the Vermont need tends to be for building analysts. And that's, you know, to do a blower door test and do the whole uh, audit of, the, uh, of your building. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. So a lot of your courses are really incredible. I'm just looking at the civil engineering piece for weatherization. So I represent the southern part of the state. And I, if some of these could be down there, I don't think, I know Vermont Tech does some nursing stuff in Bennington, that sort of thing, which is which is great. But I don't know if there's even a way to sometimes come down and offer, maybe you do with the one week, the two week courses, because I think there are a lot of young people, all sorts of people that would be really interested in doing these kinds of continuing education things. There are people that, you know, we have a college that's closing right now. People are going to be doing career changes. Uh, I could see you know, these are really interesting, important jobs. And I, I don't know if you're, you're down there much. So we're actually working with Guy Payne. Do you know 
guy. He has a program down there that does um, BPI training. Okay. Um, it's a, a slightly different um, uh, program, but we're actually partnering with him to offer classes. Okay. So what that looks like, um, we're hoping to offer in your area. We have a campus in Bennington. Right, um, down by CCB. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're, we're hoping that we can be able to expand that. We do a right. lot of partnerships with tech centers around okay. the state and as well. we have great tech centers. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and we're slowly integrating some of our technical training into the, the um, CTEs. In the past, it's been mostly healthcare, um, mostly manufacturing. Yeah. Now we're starting to look at renewable energy. Kathy's been leading that way on that. Yeah. Great. Can you say, so what is the, uh, uh, certification program called. How do you take these classes? Um, the Here's certificate that. for uh, normally it costs two thousand eight hundred dollars, okay. so it is quite expensive. And it's you have somebody that doesn't have that kind of money? Beg your pardon. Do you, uh, financial aid or any assistance for people? Well, what we did this year that was really exciting is um, in the fall we partnered, as I mentioned, with, uh, with Efficiency Vermont, and they have the grant, and they kicked in $1,000 uh, to offset. So instead of being uh, $2,800 to do the dual certification program, it was $1,800 per participant. And then they offered an additional $500 rebate to anybody who passed both of the exams. So uh, that was an added incentive. So that was great. <coughs> and we um, also work really closely with BSAC on the non-degree grant program. I just think this is so impressive, all these classes. And I, it's so important to the work that we're all doing, and it's it's great. I just love to see more of it throughout the state, mm -hmm. but I understand. I mean, there are all mm -hmm. sorts of... This, just, is, this is exciting. Yeah, in talking to Efficient <coughs> Vermont, they have something called the... Um, I don't know, it's an EEN program, and Employer Excellence Program or something like that, and uh, they have partners in with contractors throughout the state around efficiency initiatives. And um, one of the things that they said in, in surveying the folks who are able to do um, building weatherization mm -hmm. audits is that outside of Chittenden County, there is a, uh, a lack of people who are trained, and they're trying to do outreach, but it's they're still trying to figure out the best way to do that, to reach those folks. So um, in the fall, we ran the training in Randolph, so we were able to sort of um, cherry pick from the outlying uh, counties, and then uh, in the past, we've also done one in Chittenden County as well. Um, do you happen to know what your, uh, how many people think you here, so something like that? Yes, nine, we had nine folks um, do, uh, we had nine folks trained this past fall, and uh, total right now we have had 44 kid, uh, people come through the training right, since 2013. So we usually have between three and nine annually. I think one of the reasons that we had nine come through um, this past fall is because of the extensive rebate that, so instead of paying $2,800, it was substantially reduced. Um, are most of those people, well, can you say something about who's paying? Are they being sponsored in some way by a company that's sending them for the training, or are they often individuals that oh. just both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just more specifically, the nine folks who came through this past fall, three of them came from one company, and the rest were individual. You know, they had their own, you know, um, businesses, and so they, they did the training themselves. So most of these people are already doing some part of this work, and now they're just advancing in the field. Mm -hmm. And they're getting the certification so they can use that for marketing purposes. It's sort of the big yeah. housekeeping. Do you see folks on the entry level side, uh, or is, is that you're targeting uh, services to people who are further along, it sounds like? I, I'd say both. We've had some people that were new to the field, and some that have been doing it for a while and wanted the certification. Okay. Mm -hmm. Senator Rogers. 
Um, so you mentioned that you do some work with the tech centers. I'm interested in figuring out how we get tech centers teaching more of these, not just these skills, all overall trade skills, but these, these specific ones are real important. So is there a way that we can start working with them more, for them to focus more kids on this industry so that we don't have the problem finding employees to fill these positions? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple different tasks that we're taking. And Kathy, mm -hmm. if you want to speak about what you just said. I'm so speak. excited, actually. <laughs> yeah, so um, for green training, which is what I do, um, that has been my big, and I'm relatively new at Vermont Tech. I've just been there a little bit over a year. But um, my whole thing has been how can we um, reach down into the tech centers and get some early traction mm -hmm. in some of these fields. And so we just barely, one of the things that I do is solar trainings as well. And um, so we started this new thing uh, this year <coughs> from the Vermont Department of Labor, where we um, have something called an on-the-job solar training, where we have a trainer who will go into any business who does, is any at all solar related and um, teach them whatever they want to know while they're doing it. It's like on the job solar training. And as a piece of that, we've developed a module, an eight hour module that is done at the tech centers mm -hmm. to get every tech center student whose teacher wants them to learn this stuff, some basics around sol the basics of solar, how solar works. And the new thing is I'm working with Efficiency Vermont. We're talking about how we can develop a module around weatherization, sort of the, along the same lines as the solar, we do um, building science weatherization <coughs> specific module, a taster is what we're calling yeah. it, um, down in the tech centers so that they can, um, the kids can get a taster, the teachers get a taster, and they think, how can I apply what, I'm, what Vermont Tech just taught us into our own regular curriculum? So that's in the Very works, cool. is doing a taster around building science yeah. We're really trying to build a career pathway in renewable <coughs> energy. So we have, you know, uh, apprenticeship pro programs around the state. We provide related instruction instruction for electrical and plumbing. So all of the students that start at the tech center that's pre-apprenticeship, mm -hmm. then they come to us and complete their four years of training to get their journeyman license. So that's been an ongoing program. We have about seven hundred students in that program that many, and that's nice. statewide oh. 34 sites around the state wow. and it's growing I imagine we're going to have more next year so that's one piece of it we're also working on um, NCCER training which is construction related mm -hmm. apprenticeship programs and we're working with a couple of tech centers right now because we're beta testing it trying to develop a pre-apprenticeship program so students are also getting dual enrollment credit in high school which they can apply to college later if they decide to go on and it relates to our construction management degree. Nice. Um, the same with the renewable uh, programs. They get the NAVSEP certification for solar installer, but they can also use that course for our renewable energy degree program mm -hmm. they to go on. Nice. Thank you. But I think that I think that is the um, big push is how can we feed more students into the trades mm -hmm. and whatever those are and i think you have to start oh i had a big I had a big powwow with um, um various organizations so you have to start at middle school and then you have yep. to then go to high school and high school the high school pathway is either through the tech centers or through the work-based learning uh, coordinators at the high school and then what happens then you have to think about the pathway as soon as the child graduates do they have an opportunity to go into a, a career then, or an apprenticeship program then, or are they gonna go into a degree program? So to be very planful about those pathways, I think is really important. So that's why I'm really excited about the, the modules that we're gonna be doing in the tech centers around uh, building science and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, weatherization. And students don't know what they don't know until they're exposed to it. So we're doing a lot of career exploration opportunities at the middle school level. We did a big program with VTrans last summer um, around transportation issues. We've done this with coding. 
um, with Rosie Girls, which is in the nine days. Um, and we have an entrepreneurship camp that we offer on our campus. We're going to expand manufacturing. Um, that's been a little bit more challenging, but we have lab space in Williston and then that we can do that. Is there anything? So I think getting into schools is, is great. Mm -hmm. Middle school. Are you familiar, are you working with any schools around their personalized learning plans? Because you know we passed this bill a few years ago and it's a way for students, again, to take ownership in their education and, and probably get credits for these kinds of projects that, I mean, it's real science, it's real engineering. So I'm just wondering if you're connected with schools at all. So, so it's very interesting about the personalized learning plan. So my, before I came to Vermont Tech, I worked in the public school system, uh -huh. did you? <laughs> and uh, uh, so um, heavily involved in how it all works in yeah. public schools. And personalized learning plans are very different depending on the school sure, that you go sure. to and their take on what that is. Yep. And however, that's why our focus has been or my focus has been to really try to connect with the tech centers and the work-based learning coordinators. Uh -huh. Because the work-based learning coordinators in the high schools, are, their work is predicated on the PLPs that kids have. Okay. So that is a 100%. So you're in. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. That's great news. Um, it's interesting you call them tasters, these courses. So this is just to make someone aware and that the taste is a good taste, then they may go on to do more. Exactly. So we have two goals from the tasters at the test at the tech center, and I can speak specifically to the solar one that we just developed and and beta tested on Monday and Tuesday of this week, is to make sure that the kids understand the basic foundational principles of the topic. So with us, it was solar. How does solar work? How does it even work? And then number two is to have them do a specific application from soup to nuts so that when they walk out, they have actually done it, done a solar application. So um, they understand how it works and that they've actually built something from the beginning to the end, a solar project. Our solar project was um, to build an off-grid system that would power a refrigerator you know, uh, up in your hunting camp wow. uh, in the woods. Uh, so if you wanted to have a beverage in the winter time or in the fall, <laughs> you're up there. And you know, the kids were very interested <laughs> about that. Yes, yeah. and they designed their own solar. They designed their own solar frame, and they did. It. They hooked it up, and they plugged the refrigerator in, and they did all the electrical, and they designed it. And they and in eight hours, they did it wow. in eight hours. Yeah. And, they were, and then we surveyed the kids at the end. And like, would you be interested in? We talked about solar careers. We talked about cool applications of solar for the future. And then um, the question was, could you? Can you? Um, think? Do you think you could build your own off-grid application? Yes yeah. or no? And um, would you be interested in a future in solar? And out of the ten kids, two said, yes, I'm very interested in a future career of solar. So. They walked, everybody walked away with the skill set. That's you guys. And That's great. So we're going to do the same thing with uh, weatherization. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you know, so one of the things we, we end up looking at here is the billions of dollars we export, you know, bringing energy products mm -hmm. into the state. How much of that, how many of those dollars, and it's probably reasonable to be looking at 500 to 800 million of dollars a year could be spent in state if we were generating more energy and doing work uh, kind of your time mm -hmm. So I don't know if that you have a sense of the general public or that your customers have any sense of that there's a uh, you know, a bright future in all this that because there's a large opportunity waiting if we can figure out how to do it for ourselves. There's a huge opportunity waiting. We just got uh, across our desks. Uh, Peck Electric, for example, is doing a massive massive solar installation and they're like we need workers we need workers help us find the workers um, burlington electric i've been working very closely with burlington electric that gets 100 percent of their electricity from renewable sources um, working with partnership with uvm burlington electric and vermont tech to develop a solar training center as well as a research center around solar we had somebody from the department of energy uh, <coughs> Uh, come to 
to us and say what you're thinking about doing is very exciting. <laughs> Vermont could be doing so much more and the potential is there and, and that's what we're hearing from the field is help us help us uh, create the work or workforce that we need um, and in as efficient and uh, timely quick way as possible. Um, so uh, one last question. Mm -hmm. So we've well, asked a bunch of questions. Thanks for what you've talked to us mm -hmm. about. Is there something we haven't asked about or you haven't heard us think of out loud that we should be keeping in mind as we try to look for ways to grow this opportunity for, for runners? Um, what are we missing? Well, I think I, I have sat in on our on my town's energy committee um, meetings and one of the things I um, urge them to think about is what are the things that you can control versus influence? And um, so as towns are putting together their energy plans and things like that, um, maybe start with, for municipalities especially, uh, start with things that you can control. And I would say the same thing at the state level is you know, state buildings, state vehicles, state programs, start there and kind of beta test that way and roll out might be the only thing I can think of. Because I know in our municipal uh, energy plan, it was like, oh, uh, you know, residents will, you know, have 90% of our residents will be driving electric cars at such and such of a point. The municipal municipalities don't have control over that, but they do have control over their own vehicles, and they have control over their own buildings for weatherization and things like that. So maybe start there, work the case out, and move forward. That's just my own personal opinion. Thanks, Do we have to know that there's a board up there, S-12, which we passed, that's already out of the Senate, over to the House. That's about the state doing exactly what you're saying, you know, uh, lead by example. <coughs> so we have a good weatherization and efficiency program, and then we just renew it for another four years. That's great. So thanks so much okay. for being here. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you. So committee, uh, we will take a break from 30 mm -hmm. and Jude for you and Chris pick back up again. Education services, a program of Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, or CDIO. I'm honored to be testifying before you today on Vermont's Weatherization Assistance Program. I'm privileged to be able to represent the 24 outstanding members of the CEWS team in Vermont's Home Weatherization Assistance Program. The five subgrantees of the Weatherization Program are tasked with providing weatherization services to eligible Vermont households. The primary eligibility criterion for the program is that the total household income is 80% or less of the state median income. CDOEO's service area is Addison, Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle counties. Lowering the overall heating, cooling, and electrical energy burden is the critical mission of the Weatherization Network and its partners. Providing a safer and healthier home to each of our clients is an added benefit that is only now becoming truly realized and quantified. Through education, energy audits, and installed measures such as insulation, air sealing, ventilation, moisture remediation, is our program's intention to do just that. The past year has been a busy and productive one for CDWS. We assisted 206 households in creating safe, healthy, and energy efficient homes. 176 were served with Vermont Weatherization Assistance Program funds, and 30 with Department of Energy funds. Of the 206 households, 55% or 113 units received fuel assistance. 55% of the households that were served resided in single family homes. We spend an average of $8,900 on each home that we serve. Currently, we have approximately 272 households on the active waiting list. That's one and a half years worth of clients who await our services. <clears throat> on any given day, we have three to four works in service. <coughs> Currently, 35 homes have been through all the hoops to include the energy audit and are waiting for the crews to start work. This is two months, roughly two months work for our crews. All of this work is done with little to no outreach to bring in new clients. Our completed clients are our best advertising. We as a program, however, can do a lot more to help 
more Vermont families with low and moderate income. We can be a huge part in helping the state meet its goals for more reliance on renewable energy sources while lessening reliance on carbon-based fuels. There is an effort afoot to decrease the weatherization program's capabilities. CBOEO and the other agencies implementing the program in the field felt, feel that these incremental increases are quite doable. This will not come without challenge, though. The first challenge we face is a shortage of qualified workforce. As you are all aware, and you heard this week, 2.4% unemployment. Our industry is not the only ones feeling the pain of a limited workforce in Vermont. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to meet the increase in numbers, our network feels that we will need to hire an additional 15 to 25 crew installers, which is four to five per agency, depending on the amount of the increase. Five building auditors and three to four efficiency coaches. This workforce development campaign will require a strong recruit, train, and retain plan. The, recruit, the recruiting portion must understand our young folks about to leave high school or have left high school and remain underemployed and how we can attract them to our work. We will also need to target those already in the workforce who might want a career change or are underemployed. The training portion of the plan must teach basic head building skills with an emphasis on understanding how the house and occupants work together or against one another. Our work is not as simple as it seems. We change the way a house works in a substantial manner. It is a highly technical job that it takes a year on average to learn, understand, and become proficient at it. Our job, if not done, done correctly, can have detrimental effects on the home and its, res and its residents. We are also, by nature of our contract with OEO, production oriented, and the act of training new employees, quite frankly, slows our production. We do not believe that one strategy will complete the task. We need to utilize existing programs, such as resources weatherization tracks. Uh, hope to bring back Vermont Works for Women's weatherization track to include, uh, to attract women to our field. This is a proven effort that has worked well for our program in the past. We must reach out to our youth, our older Vermonters who are underemployed, or unemployed and think of new ways to attract non-traditional trades workers such as women in the new Americans. In addition, we need to have the funding ability to train folks in-house with a dedicated training coordinator per agency whose sole focus is, is to ensure the success of new employees during the on-the-job training portion. We should explore the use of Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funds, or WIOA, to bring new employees on for 90 days to ensure that the parties are a good fit for the other and a good fit for the work. We also face challenges finding enough subcontractors to maintain an efficient production queue. This is an issue for all subcontractors to include heating, plumbing, electricians, and construction specific contractors. There simply aren't enough of these folks to do the work being requested. We hired an experienced contractor to come and work directly for us as an employee. Our new heat tech performs cleaning tunes, repairs, and equipment replacements. I have a report that this new program not only did this to make us more nimble and efficient, as an organization, it reduced the wait time for service for our clients significantly, all while lowering the cost of the program. While we face many challenges throughout the year in providing this service to our Vermont neighbors, we face them with diligence towards the work we do. Each and every client receives the same level of caring and competence and receives a quality work product that affects not only their wallet, but their health, safety, and comfort. Often the thing that makes this all work well for us is the, is the hug from the elderly homeowner when the crew is leaving on the last day. I asked my employees at our last staff meeting, what do you want me to tell the rep senators when, I sit, when I'm sitting in front of them? Almost to a person, their response was something along the lines of improving the lives of our Vermont neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and can you uh, send your testimony to uh, June, and then we'll post it on our website? I will, sir. Great, thanks so much. Um, especially because we have a lot of facts and figures in there, and I could write quite fast enough to, <laughs> to keep up. Um, can you say again what your average cost per job is? Last, the last program was $8,900. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, uh, mm -hmm. as you alluded, uh, one of the things is you have to staff up um, in, in order to do more work. So you have roughly uh, 206 households and I think the total number done in the state under the flow and weatherization work is on the neighborhood of 900, is that right? So you're roughly a quarter of the program? Yes, sir. We cover the four largest 
we have the largest service area amongst the, the five. And do you do any outreach now or, or not? We do, we take the fuel, the only outreach we do is there in the summertime after we take the fuel assistance list yeah. and we send out approximately 400 mailers to those folks that are on the list that have not been weatherized. Uh -huh. okay. And that's, that's the only advertising we do. And we do do a, uh, every home that we do has a survey and we ask them about the quality of our work friendliness of the crews, proficiency of the auditors, and efficient posts. And on the back of that, we ask for two relatives or you know, community members that may also serve. And we usually get one, sometimes two on the back of that. And we automatically send them out a, uh, uh, an application. Sure. So if um, the s staffing up that you were talking about, if, if you were to be able to hire that number of people in all those positions, um, is do you think you would, would you be shy of customers once you burn through your waiting list, or? We, I don't believe so, sir. I mean, we, we, like I said, we have 274 on our waiting list. Um, that's a year and a half's worth of work at current level, and we do no outreach. So um, it's one of the best kept secrets. <laughs> and frankly, we don't do the outreach because we don't want to have people sitting on the waiting list not getting served even longer right and because of the way the priorities this, the, the, the web, it's called the WAP rank the weather station program ranking um, that's based on age financial income um, children in the home elderly in the home disabilities in the home uh, we're dealing those WAP ranks keep us from under the 60 percent level a lot I don't think I done very few in the 60 to 80 percent this year because of the lack of Senator Rogers. Uh, just a quick point going back to the last conversation. The estimate that we just heard on the average cost to weatherize a home is similar to the estimate uh, a guy I know got on his home to do asbestos remediation. So that shows you what a problem that can be when all of a sudden you got a project and you hit that asbestos and you thought you were going to spend eight or ten thousand dollars to um, insulate your home and now it's eighteen or twenty thousand dollars we spend a great deal our auditors and, and my associate director spend a great deal of their time dealing with the, the very problem vermiculite as well as other deferral issues such as a bad roof it's no mm -hmm. sense putting in insulation in the attic of a roof that's going to get destroyed and wet so you have to take care of that Furnaces, you know, you have to make sure that there's a safe furnace before you tighten the building up. Otherwise, as I said, you can have detrimental effects. Um, moisture issues. If you've got a river running through your basement, we have to take care of those first. So vermiculite is a great challenge, but there are other challenges as well. And when we deal with the 60% and less uh, income level that we are, those challenges tend to be more prevalent. For the work that's not... Um I mean, important and essential to do, like you're talking about the, the moisture problem. Um, so it's essential to do that work. Are, but are you allowed to use weatherization fund dollars to do that roof or that wet basement? We have some home repair funds within the job. We are allowed to put some of the cost of those into the job if it still can be, uh, it meets the savings to investment ratio. Okay. Uh, we also have, I have some funds from a private uh, donor that I use, and I'm very lucky to have those. And I also use uh, some leverage funds to go into there as well. Um, in terms of finding new folks, you had mentioned uh, resources, weatherization, and Vermont Works for Women. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking with VTC about their program, and we're interested in trying to make sure that if we step up, that there's there are programs that can help you find the employees you need. Can you say something about resources and Vermont Works for Women that have programs apparently, but no longer do. Resources still has a program, and they have a general, uh, they work with both youth and the middle, uh, not middle age, but above youth, uh, folks that are, have been in the job market for a while make a change. Uh, they have two different programs for those folks. Uh, they have a weatherization track, specifically, that uh, Chris Parsons is a subcontractor that we use. Uh, we supply him with the homes. He's working on a four unit multi in Burlington right now for us, where they use that as a, um, with homeowners or property owners consent, 
They use it as a training laboratory where Chris is teaching hands-on to both youth and adults. Um, they also have a basic construction program where they take at-risk youth that have graduated from high school or about to, and they come out with uh, a, national, a national construction certificate that they come out with. And we've had very good luck uh, utilizing those folks. Um, I'm most proud to say that when Vermont Works for Women was running their rotorization track program, that we hired three absolutely outstanding women. Uh, this was about five years ago. Uh, one of those crew members remains on the duty. She remains on the job and she absolutely loves it. She tried to get her to be a crew chief. She doesn't want to be a crew chief because she, she wants to work. I promoted one of them, Heather, to be my assistant production coordinator. She did a fabulous job. And then Deb Jura, the other one, she's helped us rewrite our, our client client intake process so it's much more consumer client friendly and nobody gets through the cracks mm -hmm. um, that became because we had sent an application to a gentleman six years in a row and he never returned the application so finally working with the mobile home program another one of CBO's programs we figured out why the gentleman could not read or write so the dad went over there helped him go through the process fill out the application get it done, get it through, and he's now on our waiting list for the so Those small lessons learned uh, to make changes and get it done. And is Vermont Works for Women no longer running that? They know there's, they no longer have a weatherization track. And it was apparently because they stopped because there were not enough um, females interested in our work, which can be very dirty, very not, not fun work. I say that I send my folks to hell every day. It's either a cold hell working under a mobile home in the middle of the winter, or a hot attic in July when the temperatures get up to 130, 140 degrees. But, and they come back smiling and because and, they're committed to the mission. Okay. You mentioned uh, a program for new Americans. Is that something, can you say something more about that? We have not uh, had success in tapping into the new American market. Uh, resources, is, they have a lot of uh, New Americans starting to come through their program, and we hope to um, tap into that, that pool as well. Um, I would have, yeah, on, on the workforce, I would like to say that I consider myself lucky to be in the workforce that I am in. My uh, four uh, co-directors, uh, Jim Ryan is here, he's from Nito. Uh, my workforce issues and challenges are very different than what Jim faces. Um, so, um, we heard testimony earlier from the energy co-op that said they thought total we would need 40 to 60 new employees and you're saying 15 to 25? Across the board. Across the board? In 25 new employees who are would become the installers and that's just based on the number keeps changing. Right. Um, I originally said when it was a, we were looking at a 20% increase was the first that came out. That was the 14 to 15 new installers. Okay. It's double we thought so I so is that just for CDOEO or is that system wide? That's system wide. Okay. But also remember that our uh, like our our auditors and efficiency coaches, which are more skilled positions, okay. we're all we try to grow those from within. So some of that is the back. So, so you agree with the overall like roughly 40 to 60 total job system wide? I would agree with that. Okay. And Thank you. you know, it's, it's Brian. Uh, just talked to Brian earlier in the week, I believe, about we understand that. The program comes through that we're going to have some we're going to have to build our labor force and that's going to take time mm -hmm. and that brian and a couple of the subcontractors in my area that i had reached out to them um, to start the process of bringing them in to fill part of that gap so if that four million were to come in this next year do you think you actually have the 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 power to actually spend that money for my agency, and I'm going to speak for CPO only at the moment, um, it would be a challenge, but I would use, be able to use subcontractors in that to fill in that gap until I could uh, get up. We have used subcontractors in the past, a while ago, but then, I don't know if everybody knows this, but after ERA and um, the merger money, we were at a very peak in a lot, and then we, <coughs> Reg and I started three years ago with CEO, we were kind of at the bottom of that, and we're just climbing back out of it now. And then one other question, um, I, I think there's a concept here that we would add, there's a potential to add more money each and every year and out years. Do you think you could build up the, the pipeline of, of talent to continue to add 40 to 50 new people yearly 
I've been an advocate from the beginning that this process needs to be incremental and allow us to build to, as I said, maintain the professionalism and quality of the program. Because like I said, if we don't do our job right, we all our seal poisoning, we can, and that's, that's the biggest fear for all of us is that we don't do our job right. So incremental, steady approach, yes. Great. You also mentioned um, a uh, sort of a 90-day training period or something like that. Can you say a little more about that? I'm not sure I know what that is. When we hire a candidate off the street, it doesn't matter whether they're a brand new employee, but it does a little bit. We want them to be able to read a tape measure, all that stuff, that's, that's helpful. But we also, I've, my last three employees <coughs> have not been in the building industry, and they've become very successful employees. It takes about three months for them to understand the what, the, the how of what they're doing. It, it takes a year for them to begin to understand, and these are general terms, depending on employee age, it takes them a year to understand both the how of the job and the why of the job. And that allows, when they understand the how and the why, they become more independent and they need less supervision and they become a truly fully productive member. At three months, you know, they can, you know, even on day one, they can fill a hopper with insulation. They're being productive, but are they a full productive member? Not yet. So we, and that's, those are my estimates. Of what I see from my head. so, uh, but are you saying that you there's a program that allows you to hire someone in for uh, one of the concerns I've heard from uh, private sector employers about hiring someone on and training them? What if they don't work out after three months? Now they let that person go. It's an adverse. Uh, it affects their adverse rating for unemployment, and then their employment insurance goes up. So they're uh, skittish about hiring people on that they're less confident about and that seems to be an obstacle to hiring people on that may need a little bit of a break to get into a, a regular job. I, that's why I wanted, I wanted, you know, early on I was talking about VL funds. I understand now that the, the state legislature had no, no being over, no over VO funds, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funds. Um, that's one of the things that we need to explore to bring that on for our folks. I run my office on a certain culture, and I believe that we can, and I come from 30 years in the military, and often in the military when there was a soldier that was non-performing, I'd say, give him to me, I can do it. And so I believe, for Dwight DeCoster, yeah. that I can make anybody a productive member of our team because of the culture that we have in our, in our organization. Well, thanks so much. Any questions for Mr., more questions for Mr. DeCoster? Well, thanks so much for a report from the field. It's always great to hear from the front lines. Thanks, sir. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite up uh, Mr. Ryan. Yes. You know, I mean, so you've heard the kind of conversation we're having. I think I part of what we want to do is uh, make sure that we hear from enough parts of the state that we have confident, if we're moving along, that everyone uh, agrees that there's an opportunity, whether we're talking about uh, Northeast Kingdom or we're talking about Bennington or we're talking about Champlain Valley. So can you say something about how your work runs up uh, out of your shop? We uh, pretty much uh, mirror Dwight's operations. Uh, we handle uh, we deal with Orleans, Essex, and Caledonia counties. Uh, we are the provider there. Um, the, the program essentially is the same. Uh, the, the eligibilities, uh, the priorities, uh, the need. As I was telling uh, Senator Rogers out in the hallway, I've been with the program for 35 years, and uh, each year I think, well, maybe this is the year that uh, you know, we finally take care of all the homes and the people that are eligible for the program. And here we are starting another year, and I have over a year waiting list. Yeah. Um, so can you just, just so, how do you keep track of the size of it? How many homes do you do in a year, and how, how many people on your waiting list? The uh, last year, we completed 175 units. Our grant is smaller than Dwight's, uh, 150, Two of those were with state funds and 23 with the Department of Energy funds. 
a waiting list. Uh, I printed it out yesterday. It's uh, 152. Uh, you know, and I'm not really aware of the Department of Energy money. So how does the community? I think we've seen it sort of folded into other things. Right. Is that come out of your same grant though from uh, the um, from DCF? It's a it comes from DCF. Right. So yeah. it's folded in. <clears throat> right. Thank you. And sorry, your waiting list is how many? 152. 152. Okay. Which converts to about a year's work. A year's work. Right. Yes. So 35 years is a long time. So you have a <laughs> lot of perspective on all this. If we, uh, I guess the sense I've had from testimony we've taken so far is that it's been a great program, but on the underfunded side, has it uh, always been, well, other than that blast of money that came through with ERA? Dollars has it? Would you say it's generally been uh, short of money? Always had a waiting list. There's there's always been the need for more money, yeah. um, and I don't see that that will change. It, it, and how about outreach? Are you how do you find your the homes? Uh, the fuel assistance list. We, uh, we mail out the letters from that list. Uh, word of mouth, uh, when we complete a job, uh, we have a questionnaire with a client asking uh, for any recommendations or any people that uh, they might be aware of that could use the program. We haven't had to advertise. Uh, maybe a year behind, it's, we haven't felt anything. Yeah, I'd be perverse to get a flyer to sign up and they put on the waiting list, right? A little discouraging sometimes, okay? Um, uh, so, is there anything that, uh, especially given how long you've been doing this, that we're not, you haven't heard us talking about so far, something we ought to be thinking about that we're, we haven't yet discussed at all? Oh, no, sir. Uh, you know, as <coughs> far as uh, one of our biggest concerns is recruiting, uh, recruiting help, mm -hmm. the workforce. <coughs> It's a challenge, you know, like up in the Northeast Kingdom, we have the uh, highest unemployment rate right in the state, but yet uh, it's, it's difficult to find good quality workers. And where, what's the stream for you? I mean, where do you, where do you find your workers? They, do they come out of a high school tech center or? Occasionally, or, uh, you know, we advertise in the paper for help. Uh, uh, employees will uh, recommend other folks that, uh, yeah. They know might be interested. Um, and what's your starting wage? Our starting wage with benefits is seventeen fifty. Okay. Um, that's why the stuff that VTC talked about is so <laughs> important. Try, trying to figure out how to keep pushing it down into the tech centers, because quite frankly, we, we keep hearing about all these young men they're getting lost somewhere they graduate from high school and then they don't show up on the job roles anywhere and where they go and how do we intervene earlier and start steering them towards all these trades so that as you said we've got high unemployment yet you still can't right. find the workers and it's about connecting them and giving them that skill i think um, if there are not any more questions for Mr. Rock, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'd like to invite up um, Ms. Phillips. Thank you for coming back. We didn't discourage you the first time. No. Thank you. Sarah Phillips, Director of the Office of Economic Opportunity. You heard from Jeff Wilcox last week about uh, how the Low Income Home Modernization Assistance Program operates. I'm gonna Repeat his testimony. I did, we did provide you with a lot of information last week as well, and I did bring copies of a couple things that you already have, but if you want to look at them together, it would be helpful. So. I'm, mostly I'm here to answer questions you have about the program as well. So that looks like that I don't. Yep.
yes, and you have them. They're on your website. If you look at them. Oh, great. Um, apologies about that. What? So left them someplace. But um, so, just a couple of things to note. One, I want to state on the record that the administration does not support an increase to the fuel tax. Yeah. Are you kidding? Are but I'm here to answer questions about how we would administer a ramp up of the program and uh, what the need or demand might be. I know there were questions about vermiculite earlier. I'm happy to talk about how we have a vermiculite in the program as well. Like I said, my knowledge base there. Well, what you heard was did you want to correct or, or comment around that in any way? Sure. Or? Well, I would just start with about 10%. It is correct that about 10% of the homes that we encounter do have vermiculite inflation that okay. we need to address. The average cost of abatement is about $11,000. Sometimes it's much more, but that's the average cost. Mm -hmm. We are, our program, uh, I want to say is leading the nation in how we address vermiculite in low-income home weatherization. Uh, we have managed uh, through the work of Jeff Wilcox to create a partnership with the Zonalite Trust Fund. So Zonalite is the company that largely um, used vermiculite insulation and they can contribute up to 41, no, yes, 41,000, sorry, $4,125 or 55% of the cost, the 4100 is the max, mm -hmm. towards uh, the abatement costs. In addition, we work with Belight uh, and leverage some of their funding to cover the cost of abatement, and Belight contributes up to 3750 If you're thinking about the average cost, that leaves a gap of anywhere from 1250 to 2250 okay. Sometimes we're able to cover that cost in our program, again, because as you heard Dwight speak about the savings to investment ratio or other leveraged home repair funds. So a lot of money for a lot of families to come up with. The, the it is, but largely they are not needing to come up with okay. the one thousand one hundred to two thousand dollars gap. Largely, we are able to help them come up with those funds. Occasionally, they, if the cost is more than the average eleven thousand, they may even take advantage of the heat saver loan uh, and low interest rates there. So at this point in time, for the for the vast majority of low income homeowners facing vermiculite as a barrier to weatherization, we are able to address those and not just to put home. So I'm very proud to say that that was not the case a few years ago, and we've done a lot of work in our program to be able to do that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah that's good. Um, it should, income should correlate with how safe your home is. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I also want to just state a few other pieces, and then I'm happy to answer other questions. Um, in the past 15 years, the Low Income Home Weatherization Program has weatherized over 12,000 homes. We, this year, worked with the Department of Tax and looked at a few other data sources to identify what is the unmet need in the state of Vermont in terms of homes uh, owned or occupied by low-income Vermonters that would be eligible for the program. Uh, we estimate that there are anywhere between 42 to 46,000 homes that we could weatherize that would be eligible for the program. So I know that one of the ways that we look at demand or unmet need is through the waiting list, but as you heard from uh, both Dwight and Jim, they don't do outreach because we don't want to maintain long waiting lists, but I want to let you know that there is a very large unmet yeah. need for low income <clears throat> home weatherization in the state. So if we ramp up our work, we're not going to burn through the the need anytime soon. Yes, I guess, yes, that's correct. Um, I also, my, our read on S-171 um, that directs 75% of the fuel tax revenue to the Home Weatherization Assistance Program and 25% towards a new climate, energy, and weatherization fund. I'm not sure I got the name of that correct, but um, our read on that and the fuel tax increases in the bill would mean that the boost to the home weatherization assistance program might be approximately 1.4 million. And that, uh, you know, construct was a, an opening position sure. just to start a conversation about if we raise more money, however we raise it, right. can we uh, support both programs at a higher level? Sure. Um, at 1.4 million increase in the program, so depending, so the questions around workforce and ramp up would obviously depend in, be dependent on how much you were asking us to do in addition. Um, 1.4 million is a very manageable number. Uh, 
we did provide, at the request of House Energy and Transportation, some administrative considerations for what a doubling of the program would mean. They had not defined doubling of the program. We did, and this is part of what we provided last week, um, that is on your website as a document under Jeff's testimony. I apologize, I, I um, that I made copies, but um, that looked at administrative considerations and talked about the workforce challenges, but also looked at the increase in staffing that would be needed. I want to uh, be clear that any increase in funding of more than $3 million to the program would also require additional administration at the state level to, be able to support that. Our work is I mean, how many important in terms of monitoring and quality assurance. Um, anything over $3 million increase in the program, we would likely need to add one FTE as a, in addition to some subcontracts for training. Um, I was under the impression that it, it, it kept stepping up. So for instance, can you give me some thresholds if you were, because if we're talking about doubling, you know, I guess you're at 11 million total, and if we're aiming towards <coughs> doubling, which I think people mm -hmm. really think is that there's able testimony to indicate that doubling is not overdoing, right? So if we're, uh, can you give us figures for, you know, for like four million more, or six million more, or nine million more, like how does that work? And what kind of staffing would go with those kinds of increased levels of effort? So for, I think it's fair to say that for three million more to the program statewide, you would add 30 FTEs to the providers, various levels of positions. Anything more than three million increase would also require additional staffing at the state office in order to monitor the program. I would say that that's our threshold. More than three million would require for us to have an additional FTE to monitor the program. More than six million would likely require two FTEs. Part of that is based <coughs> on the fact that we also audit, we monitor uh, to staff in the field today, monitoring at CBOEO. Uh, we monitor 10% of the units completed to ensure quality assurance. I think as you've heard, to truly achieve energy savings and weatherization, quality is key. Um, and so that's a really important part of the program. We really want to see the energy savings. And if we went closer to uh, 10? Uh, we have three FTEs. <coughs> uh, when you're out. Auditing, so it's great that you're doing that. I mean, everyone wants to know the program's working well. What kind of rate do you see for needing for the uh, contractor to come back in and do additional work? That's a good question. Um, I don't know so that I can. Sure get what kind of work are, are they how seeing? Often, how often do you see, <coughs> see a, a lapse where you say, oh, well, someone. We can't sign off on this yet. Someone needs the yeah. contractor needs to return or something. return or go back. Well, right. I, yes. so sort of a pop question. Yeah, if you can check into it and just. I let can't. I don't know that I can give you a rate off the top yeah. of my head. I will say that there are times when we ask uh, providers to go back, maybe quickly because there's a missed opportunity, uh, not <coughs> different than the measure being installed incorrectly. Most times, they do, there's no need to go back. Uh, but our network of providers are very good at, um, at doing that work when they need to. But I'm happy to get you more of a rate if you like. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, also, you came with a lot of information mm -hmm. the first time that we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, could you? Uh, I don't know if everyone has access to copies. They're uh, online. No, should we send copies? It starts like this. Yeah, I can. Oh. Right, I apologize. No, that's okay. Was, you already gave it to us. I did. Right. So it would have been under Tuesday stuff, when Jeff was here last Tuesday. Okay. Um, it would be listed there. <coughs> yes, I'm happy to walk through some sure. of them. I mean, sure. Uh, I'll make sure everyone has a hard copy, or uh, but while you're back with us, if there are things in here that you want to highlight for us, that would be very helpful. A lot of good data. 
Well, those, they're two separate documents. So one is uh, I think there's sometimes a confusion about the funding in the program. So I'll just start with there. We do have Department of Energy funds that come, that flow through our office as part of the weatherization assistance program. That's roughly 1.2 million. Uh, annually, this year was a little higher, but 1.2 million. So we think of as the base for the Department of Energy funds. Uh, we also, um, as as you're aware, the fuel tax, as it currently stands, produces approximately 10.3 million in revenue annually. Of that 10.3 million. about 6.3 million support uh, the weatherization program, 3.4 million goes to the LIHEAP program, then we take 3.4 million from LIHEAP to use for weatherization. So that's the swap that you may have referred to. Mm -hmm. So that swap is, is a one-to-one -one swap and it creates general fund savings because of the way that the LIHEAP program operates. We can talk more about that, but I don't think it's sure. germane. Uh, so, so a quick question on DOE yeah. money. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of the directors referred to it. Uh, they did. Um, you know, like, I don't know. It's, they were saying um, low income weatherization homes, and then they were saying DOE homes. So are there? Uh, do you put them out in different awards? <laughs> We do issue them under separate grants. We generally operate the program under one set of rules. We have one tech manual, technical manual that guides the work of weatherization. There are some slightly different eligibility requirements around the DOE funds, which are up to 200% of federal poverty level, as opposed to the state weatherization assistance program, which funds up to 80% area median income. So there's some slight differences, um, and so we administer them under separate grants, but it's really one whole program operates with one set of guidelines. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. So functionally, if you're out in the field, someone doesn't know that they're getting uh, the DOE weatherization program versus the, the home zone. Correct. That from a client's perspective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so. Uh, so just so you know, again, what's in front of you. One is uh, House Ways and Means had asked us to speak more specifically to the fuel tax revenue as it stands. And so one of the memos is um, that information that we provided to them. On the back side of that, there's sometimes some confusion about how the funding works for the programs. On the back side of that is this chart at the top that looks like this. Okay, it's sort of a... Oh, you might not have that. So, I have it. Okay, there. you have it. So, I think that is, we all have it. it. Looks like this. The looks a little different. Okay, this uh, this chart right here is the source and use mm -hmm. budget, right? So what this chart explains is there's sort of three buckets of, of work that we do. One is the emergency heating repair and replacement program. One is the core weatherization work, and the the other bucket is OEO administration. And then it breaks down our three funding sources, yeah. which would be. The HWAP fund, the fuel tax revenue, LIHEAP because of the swap, and Department of Energy money, and it shows the split and how that works. So uh, that is sometimes helpful in understanding uh, where the money goes. It's our effort at transparency. There's a lot of ways that we can slice and dice this information, but I think this is the most transparent. So I want to point that out to you in terms of understanding how the funding flows through the program. Look at that. You don't want that one. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other? I know. No, it's your help. I like it. <coughs> Thank so you very much. One of the things we've been talking about uh, fairly regularly is overhead. So if I'm looking at a uh, $10 million plus program and OEO administration is 371 year, somewhere. Under under four percent. Yeah, approximately like three three percent. I'm sorry. What's your concern? Well, so we're, trying to, about, we're trying to when we look at anything that we're working yeah. on, granting money out to the field to do work, but it's water or right, weatherization and what kind of administrative costs are entailed for the program. Okay. Okay. They're going at three percent versus the fifteen we gave in the Clean Water Bank. <laughs> They're much more efficient. Well, I I also <laughs> should say that we do. 
pass on it, that our providers also get some administrative costs, obviously, for the <coughs> field. Uh, roughly 10% of their grants is administration. Well, that's somewhat reassuring in the end that didn't know that you were in the ball. Okay. Pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, flow of people into, so it seems as though everyone has their own way of finding employees. Um, so you have your own employees, and then you also grant out to others. Do you have, does your um, department assist in creating that pipeline for employees, or is that something where um, CDO and the others are sort of left to fend for themselves in terms of developing their own pipeline of new employees? Uh, well, we have three, right, we have three FTEs for the weatherization program at OEO. Uh, there's some limitations to our capacity, for sure. This is an area of major need and challenge as we think about how to ramp up, and it is an area that we are actively involved in conversations with the providers on how we can support them and how strategically the five providers with our office would work together. I'd like to uh, follow up with BTC. I know there's a strong interest in being able to use um, the tech programs to uh, feed as a pipeline resource. And Vermont Works for Women have worked well in parts of areas of the state where, where they kind of program. Uh, and I do think, so, I expect that we will be doing more to support the five providers in this mm -hmm. in this area in the, in the next six to 12 months. Parent. Your average cost is eighty five hundred dollars for project. Does that include the administrative cost? No. Okay. How much would it be? Eighty five hundred. Yeah, there's a, per, yeah, there's a job. So the job cost average, right, which is the funding that you can tie to an individual job, right? Right. And so that does create it. an average on as a whole, right? That does not. There's it does not include administration. And we also, um, yes, so that's a simple answer. So um, leaving aside where the money would ever come from, uh, in terms of a capacity looking not just uh, at next year, but years beyond, um, uh, do you have a sense of <clears throat> um, what rate is sort of a, I don't know, a responsible, practicable, great for us to think about if we're trying not just to do it a single year adjustment let's say we're way behind for instance on our 80,000 homes by 2020 schedule how how uh, much more work could we do at what rate that seems like kind of a responsible buildup so that is the other so besides the memo to house ways and means that we've shared with you house energy and transportation Energy and technology, sorry, uh, asked us that. And that is what the other memo speaks to. And we, in that memo, outlined if we were, we were asked what it would be if we doubled the program. We assumed that double the program meant roughly $9 million more. And in that memo, we provided um, a ramp up that looks like three, yeah, it looks like three million, six million, nine million. Uh, we would, there are some substantial costs that go into the weatherization program in terms of building assets, not just workforce, right? There are trucks, there's equipment. Uh, to fully realize the cost effectiveness of doubling a program, it wouldn't, um, to fully do that, you would want to sustain the program at that rate for at least a few years, right? Three to five years. Right. Not a boom and bust cycle. Right. Otherwise, the cost of the boot, you know, the cost of doing the work is higher. You just don't get the same cost effectiveness to have sort of a one-year double to go back down. So that that is what we looked at, and that is the the way that we would see doing uh, an increase in an accelerated or expanded web load weatherization assistance program that we think could be manageable in terms of the workforce challenges. Well, uh, that is. I can't talk and use my calculator the same way, the same time as a parent can. If we took, say, 45,000, that's the that unmet need, and divided by your ramped up rate, which is 17, 25, 100, how many years worth of- Oh, it's 26 years. 26 years of waiting, or 26 years worth of work. <laughs> 
pay something. I have it at forty. Two, I did it at forty-two thousand. It was twenty-four point seven. So the extra three thousand is another two years. It's also a cost at the eighty. We've heard between eighty-five and eighty-nine hundred. I just used the eighty-nine hundred number because I already started. It added the thirteen percent administrative cost. It's a four hundred twenty-five million dollar tag over that time on the forty-two thousand home. So you got to add three thousand more. So that's another. 10% roughly, so you're talking about a half a billion dollars. Just for low income. That's not middle income. We saw some pretty big numbers when RAP came through, right? Where they said, take on the whole weatherization thing. I think their well, figure was 500 million to achieve about 924 million in net savings. Well, yeah, I mean, but you'd have to do it over time, so your savings are, so your alternatives are. Right. It'd be more complicated, I think. Yeah, value. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for helping us fill in the picture more. <clears throat> You've heard some of the conversations in your two visits. Um, <coughs> is there anything that uh, you think we haven't talked about? talked about that we should be thinking about to make sure that we're not there's we're not leaving some stone unturned in terms of trying to make sure we're really thinking the whole thing through carefully. Um, I think that Jeff spoke to this and so you've heard it, but I, I think it's worth saying again that the return on investment for weatherization is not just the energy savings or the reduction in carbon emissions. It's also the health quality of the homes. Yeah. It's also the affordability for folks in terms of their own paying their own bills. So I think um, it just it's worth I think and those returns on investments are highest with low income homes because such a large percentage of their income is dedicated. They to experience warm the highest the energy burden. They have the poorest quality homes uh, and the oldest homes in the state, and uh, for those reasons, you just see a strong return on investment. We are also very supportive of expanding weatherization in moderate income homes, but I'm gonna to speak to what our program does. Well, uh, are there any other questions from these folks? Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate yeah. it. So if there, uh, we're going to be coming back to this again tomorrow. The, the focus being on the. Are you joining us? I see one, you on our agenda. Twenty. Yeah. So, just going to say, oh, I don't have. I'm sorry. That's uh, I have doesn't include you. I was just going to say, is there anyone else in the room who would like to speak? So we're up to the same mind. I just don't have the right piece of paper. Um, it's buried in there. Somewhere. It's buried. And it's not too. My my issue. So thanks for coming to this walk again. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Karen Lafayette, I'm representing the Vermont Community Action Partnership and the Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council. Um, and uh, the <coughs> Low Income Advocacy Council has been supportive of the Low Income Weatherization Program for a long, long time. Uh, we have also been participating in the climate action groups uh, and especially, <coughs> specifically to their accelerated weatherization uh, program. So today I wanted to speak to um, the Low Income Weatherization Program and what we've done over the course of, uh, of a number of years with the tax structure um, and also uh, speak to the language in your bill and what works what doesn't work for our purposes uh, and then um, talk about you know how we want to participate in the, in the expansion to lower and moderate income homes and what we envision that that split of revenues look like I can also um, let you know if you're interested on, on um, uh, some of the things that are coming out of the house and, and um, some of the things that we've done with respect to the tax that they just passed um, and workforce training efforts, uh, that type of thing. So, great. We might as well do one stop shopping. So, okay. Take it away. So, uh, um, in 1990, we began our own state, we, we raised our own state tax dollars uh, to support the low income weatherization program and expand it. Uh, for 29 years, uh, the gross receipts tax and now the two cents fuel tax and the gross receipts tax had been dedicated to the home weatherization assistance program. The program has grown steadily um, and the more fuel prices went up when it was the gross receipts, 
the more revenues available, the more homes you can do, and, and that's how it worked. As costs went up, people were paying more for fuel, uh, there was more revenues, we could do more homes and reduce uh, the cost. And, and as you've heard testimony, um, now uh, the average savings of, of a home is about 29%, and we estimate that to be anywhere from 500 to $700, depending on fuel usage. Um, so a number of years back, uh, we were beneficiaries of the air monies and the GMP merger monies. Um, HWAP, the Home Weatherization Assistance Program, ramped up their services, um, uh, ramped up their services, um, added uh, capacity, um, and added a number of units. So, so we, we certainly had a high of nearly double what, what we're doing right now with those monies. Um, and then um, at the same time those monies went away, fuel prices dropped dramatically um, and, and actually we were losing money. So the budgets, our budgets uh, for the Home Weatherization Assistance Program uh, diminished. So three years ago what we did is we restructured the tax um, instead of the, at least on fossil fuels, instead of that being based on the gross receipts because fuel prices were down, we base that on, on basically per gallon. So we, we attached a two cent per gallon cost to the fossil fuels, and we slightly increased the, um, uh, from 0.5 uh, on natural gas to um, 0.75. So that did stabilize the revenues. Uh, and in fact, um, now that I think we've had a full year of, of um, getting those revenues in the door, um, they have increased. Um, uh, uh, slightly, and I don't know the exact, you'd have to get that from, from uh, the tax department, um, and there's some estimates from JFO as well. But we have stabilized um, by, by attaching that to the number of units, um, and, um, and those, those revenues are growing. Um, I, I've taken a look, uh, in fact, it's evidenced by the two budgets that, that, are, uh, that, that you're gonna see um, in um, both through the budget adjustment and, and the fiscal year 2020 budget that the House is proposing. Um, uh, there are additional monies uh, in the weatherization program um, and, and those budgets reflect that increase from, to, from about 10 to 12, Sarah, that's in those budgets. That's what, it, that's what it looks like on paper that I see that's in the budgets. Um, uh, that has been authorized to spend um, through the budget adjustment uh, and, and then what's being proposed. Um, so I've taken a look at the strike all amendment for S171 um, and I think there's uh, improvements in the language um, but what we're concerned about is the pooling of all of our original dedicated revenues um, and then the distribution through the percentages of 75 and 25, um, we don't think work for our purposes. Um, the percentage structure is not what we envisioned. Um, our first priority um, this year was to uh, make sure that we, um, we reauthorize the fuel tax because it, it was sunsetting um, this year in June. So we want to reauthorize the fuel tax, make sure that kept coming in. And the second priority was to maintain the core funding dedicated to the HWAP programs in light of all the talk about expanding the tax and, and um, expanding weatherization efforts. And we are happy to be participating that in. We too would love to have um, part of the increase dedicated to the Home Weatherization Assistance Program, um, but only the additional revenues. Um, so regardless of any increases, the initial two cents on fuels, the 0.75 on natural gas, and the 0.5 on electricity uh, should continue to be dedicated to the Home Weatherization Assistance Program. Uh, in fact, you don't, um, in your proposed bill, um, and in what you're gonna see coming over from the House, um, they do increase natural gas and they do increase the, the two cents to four cents. But no one has talked about, and we do not want to increase the 0.5 on electricity. Um, but but in in the way that your bill is structured, if, uh, at least the way I read it, um, it would be also putting that elect, uh, electricity revenues into a pool that then would get distributed. Which, so I think which one? which revenues? 
the, all, all of the revenues from the existing current taxes and the additional taxes. Um, and we just want to safeguard the core funding for the weatherization program. It was never envisioned that the 0.5 um, uh, on, on electricity would be used for other purposes than the home weatherization assistance program. I think Sarah gave you an estimate of, of yeah. So you're referring to the 0.5, not the 9 percent. Not the 9 percent? Which we pay tax on our electric bills. Right. Energy oh. efficiency charge. We, we had this conversation last year, I think, Senator, I remember very well, in Senate Finance about the I, electric I'm just bill. asking, when <coughs> yes. you say the tax, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the 0.5 percent on you. electrical Thank usage. You. Thank you. Is that 0.5 of the 9? Is that 0.5 out of the total nine? That's no. So one is the, the energy efficiency chart that appears on your electric bill is separate from okay. the uh, charge. Um, so just to make sure I'm following, in terms of pres when you say preserving core funding, are you saying, for instance, if you took all the revenues as they were allocated when it was at, at, at two cents, that that would be unchanged? But for the increment, if we went from two to four, that's where you would start to see the split. And yes, that's an acceptable that's exactly construct. Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. on an increase split, but preserve the core funding underneath it. When we were working with the other weatherization expansion advocates, um, it was only the increased dollars that we envisioned being split. Um, in the proposal you received the other day, um, I think when uh, some of the other advocates uh, were in here, and I have paper copies of it. But that was the accelerated weatherization program. And although we, we wanted to see step increases in, in uh, each year, um, what, um, what that, that um, details, let's see. Um, it, it shows what the step increase would be, but if you can see the line on the bottom half of the first page, it says, existing revenues shall expressly continue to be dedicated to the home weatherization assistance program created in 33 VSA chapter 25. An allocation of additional revenues raised would include no less than 35% to the low income weatherization assistance program, <coughs> no less than 40% to the programs for 60 to 120 percent of HUD area median, no less than five percent to affordable multifamily units uh, developed, assisted through 3D thermal, up to 10 percent of existing market rate thermal conserva conservation measures, and up to 10 percent for workforce development and marketing for people, up to 120 percent uh, of the median. And as you know, you've heard testimony. Um, that uh, although the weatherization assistance program can serve up to 80% of median, often the 60 to 80 um, folks don't get served because there's a priority list and there's so much need um, uh, for the folks that are elder, have a disability, children under six, and life abusers that, that, that often, that, that mo more moderate or upper level of low income doesn't necessarily get served and they can wait longer. So, we are interested in, in having additional funds to also um, address those folks as well. Can you um, say something about uh, who, I mean, if we were to adopt such a thing, mm -hmm. who, this is, is this a consensus, a, a consensus amongst which parties? It's a consensus against some of these folks um, that are working um, on, on the climate change and the, the specific accelerated weatherization program. Um, Abby can speak to that, as can um, uh, Joey Miller uh, and, and a number of others, and there's many organizations represented here. Um, so so we, just, we just want to find some way to uh, safeguard that. I, I think there's plenty of ways to do that in, uh, in language. Um, um, you, could, you could say something to the effect of, um, the first two cents on fuel, of the first 75 on, on um, natural gas, and the 0.5 uh, continue to be dedicated to the home weatherization assistance program, the additional two cents, and it gets split in a certain way if you want to get into the details or goes to the efficiency fund as you 
uh, or the efficiency folks to, to, to distribute that and, and then there there has been some work on, on how that is achieved. Okay. So, so um, and those extra dollars flow into I mean, their programs mainly been ready money, forward capacity market money, and now we're adding a third stream. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Senator. Uh, okay. Well, so it'll be a question. My hearing is sorry. Right. It'll be a question for Abby to, to for Ms. White tomorrow. I okay. Think, to talk about um, how this would work in their program. But. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thanks. We, we uh, as I said, we, we have uh, an interest in participating in that. Uh, we would love additional revenues out of the additional money, and we just want to safeguard the program. It's been dedicated for 28 years to this program. It's worked very well. The Home Motorization Assistance Program is evaluated uh, you know, e every year. Um, it has all kinds of accolades. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the challenges that you talked about is the workforce training. Um, and that's why this year in the House, uh, we work with the House Commerce Committee uh, in fact, in their, um, their workforce training bill that just pa passed the House 124 to, to zero and they had unanimous support on the House floor, there's a specific weatherization assistance program and uh, they dedicated $350,000 as a, as a base to start to enhance the existing um, 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 training programs for weatherization. Um, and the details on, on, on how that money might be able to be used. Uh, but um, certainly the CAPS, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, weatherization assistance programs that assist in the state, um, you know, have met, have met the challenge before, um, but they do understand this is basically like a, a pilot project to start for the long term on how to recruit, um, uh, train, and, and retain uh, qualified workers in the home weatherization assistance program. Um, do you happen to know, so 350, do you know how that compares to the current level of investment? <coughs> um, I don't know if Sarah can answer what the state does for um, training uh, now. Sure, we do include training and technical assistance funds as part of the weatherization program now. Uh, we, off the top of my head, a rough estimate would be we spent about 250,000. Uh, so, for instance, the BTC BPS certification program, we do require a certification for energy auditors, and they might go, the staff might go through that program get a certification, and our program would pay for the cost of doing that. Great. So, that's an example of how those funds get used. So, so um, home weatherization assistance folks, um, uh, they did get together, and they have sort of a, a, um, a plan for the future on how to do that, and and the different components of, of um, how that what that weatherization training program would look to enhance what's currently being done, sure. on and where, where they would spend the monies. And I can get that detail to you if you'd like to look at it. Right. Well, you're reminding me there's other threads to all this. I'm figuring anyone who's talking about um, housing programs, new construction, there is a natural fit there. There'd be the same kind of training. That sure. That would go into building new. As well as There's other things in that workforce training bill that speak to other, other training areas. So, um, um, uh, but it, it, it it's um, it, it was supported. Um, it's in your your house your Senate Economic Development Committee um, as we speak. Um, they're testifying on on that particular bill. So we're trying to think forward about what it really would take to ramp up and be able to get um, a substantial amount of money out in weatherization. As you know, you've heard. From the RAP report and from everything else, that the, the best bang for the buck is 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 to do weatherization. And as Sarah indicated, it's more than just um, it's more than just the the any reduction in emissions or even reduction in in the cost to to the homes, uh, but it's jobs, it's economy, it's materials, it's, it's local workers, it's uh, health and welfare and safety and comfort of, of folks in their homes. So. Uh, that's why we've always been very, very supportive of it, and and we supported the, the increasing the tax, even though that is a concern, is that it, it, it could cost um, low-income uh, folks an extra fifteen dollars a year. We believe the benefits far outweigh what that additional cost might be. Um, uh, I can speak to the house actions uh, if you're interested, or you'll be getting that soon enough. Um, but, as you know, they did pass H-439. It includes a two cent increase uh, on the fuels. 
it includes um, uh, another, um, it, it includes, um, goes up from 0.75 on natural gas to 1.0%, um, and then 1.5% on the retail sale of coal. Um, there was about 10 amendments to that. Um, all of them except for one field, and that was the uh, exemption for dyed diesel went through. And they not only exempted them from the increased tax, but in the current two cent tax that they are currently paying. Um, and they don't have to pay that. They don't have to, not if that, that bill is successful. Pay, yeah. So I, I think the estimate on that um, was. Uh, Two hundred and twenty-five thousand for every two cents, so it's four hundred and fifty thousand. The exemption, as you know, the H forty-nine contains an increase uh, in the tax and speaks to those elements I just talked about. But it is the um, it is the revenue bill that has not yet passed the House that has the reauthorization in it, and also has a clarification of any exemptions. Um, um, that, that were, when we restructured three years ago, the language that was put in the bill, and this is more of a Senate finance, but said uh, uh, any of the, uh, the fuels delivered to individuals or businesses, some nonprofits looked at that and said, I'm neither one of those, so I don't have to pay this tax. So they stopped paying what they were paying before. Um, and, but the, the Ways and Means Committee in the House side um, has proposed clearing that up um, and they would get rid of all of those uh, any exemptions um, for nonprofits and municipalities or anybody else who thought they didn't need to pay the tax um, because they had been paying it up until three years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, you mentioned that gave a dollar figure for saving for households for low income. Mm -hmm. You got to ask me what was that? Five hundred to seven hundred dollars, depending. No, it, was, it was like in the teens. Twenty-nine percent. Fifteen dollars. Oh, fifteen dollars a year. Extra that they'd be paying a year. For the two cents. Fifteen. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so so if you're at the end of the list, fifteen times twenty-seven. Cost yeah. to get your other exit because there's twenty-seven years of a waiting list. Mm -hmm. So if you're at the end of that list, it's a pretty right. expensive right. proposal. Before you get your authorization. Great, you are. It takes too darn long to get there for two cents, two dollars a gallon. Okay, so I missed the fifteen dollars. That was fifteen dollars on the fuel price for uh, on the increase. On the increase, an so extra fifteen dollars. The extra two cents on the fuel would cost uh, the average homeowner fifteen dollars a year annual. uh, annually. Annually. Mm -hmm. The way I understand it, they also removed the exemption for municipal vehicles, which means that's going to show up on our local property tax bill. Right, because that's included in. Yep, that's included in the two cents. <clears throat> well, thank you for the heads up for, and for, 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 for uh, reporting. Uh, uh, any other? So you've heard the conversation. Mm -hmm. Anything so we've? Uh, we're trying to make sure we're not um, leaving any stone unturned on this uh, really before is. moving forward. Is is that. Anything you've heard us not talked about that you think they should keep in mind while we keep working? The, the, the only thing I would suggest is one thing I did mention is that the house increase, it is solely dedicated to the home weatherization assistance right. program. Um, so um, and, and it was a pretty heavy lift and, and um, you know, we have to be thinking about um, hopefully getting something that can get to the government desk and be signed. Yeah. No four amendments to push uh, uh, four more cents on instead of just two or anything. My thoughts on that? No. no oh, were there any? Oh, were there any questions? I'm sorry. Anyone try to increase no. more than the two cents? Uh, no. The, a couple of the amendments. Um, what they wanted to do was uh, yes, increase it more, but with with an income tax <coughs> surcharge. Okay. So, and then that was ten million dollars, and it, it just went to earners over two hundred thousand dollars to raise ten million for the purposes. But you get fifteen votes. Okay. Um, any other questions from Ms. Lafayette? Thanks so much. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> thank you for the meeting. Uh, again, uh, based on our conversation this morning, we'll be postponing action on S96. So I'd ask everyone who supports the bill to act as an ambassador uh, to answer questions for people in the caucus. Um, and 
I'm going to be encouraging anyone who has questions to bring to any member of the committee for uh, so that we'll postpone just for a day, give them a little extra time. Yeah, With that, we are adjourned. Thanks so much. Thanks for that.